The views and opinions expressed are those of the sponsor and do not necessarily reflect the views of Radio 1, WTLC AM 1310, 95.1 FM, and its management. This is Dr. Virginia Kane, Director of the Marion County Public Health Department. We are proud to sponsor Medically Speaking. The Marion County Public Health Department is dedicated to serving you and the needs of our community. So stay tuned right here for information and your comments and questions on Medically Speaking. Good morning and welcome to Medically Speaking, sponsored by the Marion County Public Health Department. I am your host, Dr. Brooke Scott. On today's program, we'll spend the hour with three special guests to talk about the issue of lead and the importance of testing for children. We would like to thank the Indianapolis chapter of the NWICP for assisting in today's program as the organization continues to make lead testing in children a priority in public health efforts in the state. Lead is a public health concern, and because of the threat it poses to the health of of young children, the Centers for CDC and Prevention says that all children who are at risk for lead exposure should be tested for lead poisoning. Some children are more likely to be exposed than others. We'll explore this in more detail during the next hours, and we'll welcome State State Senator, excuse me, um, State Senator Jean Bro. Indiana Department of Health Commissioner Dr. Lindsay Weaver and Carla Johnson, the administrator of a department that includes lead testing initiatives at the Marion County Public Health Department. Stay tuned for all of these topics until 11 a.m. here on Medically Speaking. The ABCs of Diabetes is a free four-part self-management program offered by the Marion County Public Health Department. The classes are open to anyone with di- with diabetes or pre-diabetes. Friends and family members are also welcome. Topics include instructions on medications, nutrition, exercise, monitoring, and available community resources. The classes in October will be offered online on Tuesdays, October 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st from 1.30 until 3 p.m. The classes are free, but registration is required one week prior to the first class. To register or for more information, please visit marionhealth.org slash diabetes. Again, that is marionhealth.org slash diabetes or call 317-221-2094. Again, that is 317-221-2094. Now, um, as we begin our conversation today today about lead poisoning in children or lead testing in children, um, we turn first to state legislation um, that was signed into law last year and went into effect at the beginning of this year. This law is designed to encourage more testing of children for lead. Joining us now to talk more about this new state law is State Senator Jean Bro, um, who is co-sponsored the bill. So, uh, Senator Bro. Welcome to Medically Speaking. Well, well, good morning. Thank you for um, focusing your attention in this program on lead testing, uh, which is a very important um, uh, process that uh, we need to support and we need to encourage everyone to get these tests because, as you will probably hear from Dr. Weaver, lead is, is something that is eradicatable. We, we can... We can eradicate this uh, disease in children, and it has such huge consequences. But to speak specifically uh, to the bill, um, I've been working on uh, lead testing as a result of Carlson Waterhouse, who was a professor here at uh, Indiana you know, IUPUI in Indianapolis, who brought it first brought it to my attention that the federal law required that. Uh, Medicaid, children on Medicaid, all children on Medicaid under the age of three, I believe it is, be tested. And uh, we were not doing that in Indiana. So mm-hmm. we were not in compliance with the uh, requirements of the law. So that's what first got me started. But the bill that was specifically was signed into law by Governor Holcomb um, last session actually requires lead testing for children um uh, under the age of five, so all children under the age of five should be get should get lead tested um, to make sure that they are not uh, susceptible to lead uh, in their system. Mm-hmm. And the reason that is so important is because um, lead can really affect cognitive development. 
and can have long-term, uh, long-lasting consequences, uh, particularly when uh, it's it found to be in children. And it's not something that can be corrected. Um, so the best thing is to let's let's get it tested um, and figure out how to um, mitigate for it, and that will then benefit the long-term development of children. And a lot of uh, children who live in uh, rural, um, impoverished communities are have um, access to to lead or, or find find lead in the water or lead in their their paint or lead in their soil. So um, this is something that uh, really has an equity equity issue uh, associated with it as well. So, uh, what are the boundaries of your district, and how long have you served at the Indiana State House? Oh, the boundaries of my district. I, I, my district has just been re, re um, designed. So uh, I go a little farther now into Lawrence than I did uh, when this bill was enacted. But um, I'm predominantly a Marion County legislator, which means I have uh, portions of Center Township. Warren Township, Lawrence Township, a lot of Lawrence Township, mm -hmm. and um, uh, Washington Township. So I am the center of the city um, east uh, to the Hancock County line. And I have been in the Indiana General Assembly um, for about 16 years oh, wow. now. So what is the, the new state law, like what data and research was used to get the bill drafted and passed? Um, what data mm -hmm. was used? Yes, ma'am. Well, um, again, uh, what we know is that um, if we can prevent lead from um, getting into the systems of young children, uh, we can have a um, – the consequences for uh, their development, their long-term cognitive development uh, will be considerably improved. and. And data has shown that that perhaps some of the um, um, some of the challenges that children have in school, um, developmentally and uh, from an emotional um, standpoint, uh, may be linked back to the fact that lead that they have been um, not tested or they have not been diagnosed to have lead in their system. And if we could have gotten them tested, we might have found that uh, some of the challenges that they were experiencing was the result of lead. Hmm. So the earlier that we can diagnose that lead uh, is a problem and that lead is in the environment, then the, the better chances we have of helping children uh, have a much healthier uh, start in life. Now, um, why would you say this bill is important for the safety of our children? Um, as, I, as I've said, um, lead is um, lead is a very toxic. Um, um, it, it's a, it's very toxic and uh, does great a great deal of harm uh, when ingested or uh, you know when eaten um, as a result of. Uh, eating the paint or with, uh, eating the dirt when, you, when you're out playing in the dirt or, or um, when you drink it in your water. And so um, it, it, um, it can affect your attention span. Uh, it can affect your um, ability to uh, concentrate and to think clearly. And, um, and all of these are... Um, symptoms of children sometimes with um, mm -hmm. um, ADHD, um, attention deficit disorder. Uh, perhaps there's a link to lead that's been undiagnosed. Oh, wow. And so the earlier that we can try to identify uh, the potential of lead um, in a child's um, development, then the better chances we can have of mitigating the consequences, the long-term consequences of uh, lead poisoning in in children. Um, the, the longer that they go without getting it diagnosed, um, without getting it addressed, um, then the more consequential the damage is to that child and to that child's developmental opportunities. 
Mm-hmm. All right. That was State Senator Jean Bro, um, who is a co-sponsor of the House Bill 1313 from the 2022 legislative sl- session. Um, Senator Bro represents District 34, which includes the east side of Indianapolis and portions of Center, Washington, Lawrence, and Warren Townships. Um, we thank her for this time this morning. We are going to step away for a quick break, but when we come back, we'll be joined by Indiana Department of Health Commissioner Dr. Lindsay Weaver here on Medically Speaking. She's so smooth. So I'm interrupting my own shower to remind you to treat your skin like the queen she is with Olay Hyaluronic Body Wash. Packed with Olay's highest level of vitamin B3 complex. It's so moisturizing that it will give you visibly smoother, head-turning skin in just 14 days. People wondering, how'd she get so smooth? Olay Hyaluronic Body Wash. Also, try Olay Hyaluronic Body Lotion. I can't believe how expensive gas is. Oh, I never pay full price for gas. I use the free Upside app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Can you really get paid cash back when you buy gas with the Upside app? I've made around $200. That's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free Upside app now. Download the free Upside app to earn real cash back every time you buy gas. Cash out any time to your bank account, PayPal, or e-gift card. Download the free Upside app now and use promo code STAR for an extra 25 cents per gallon cash back on your first fill up. That's promo code STAR. This is Dr. Virginia Kane, Director of the Marion County Public Health Department. We are proud to sponsor Medically Speaking. The Marion County Public Health Department is dedicated to serving you and the needs of our community. So stay tuned right here for information and your comments and questions on Medically Speaking. Welcome back to Medically Speaking, sponsored by the Marion County Public Health Department. I am your host, Dr. Brooke Scott. So today our focus is on lead testing and the potential health threat to the children in our community. The Indianapolis chapter of the NAACP is joining Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield to sponsor a free community baby shower and lead testing event tomorrow, October 1st from 2 to 4 p.m. This will take place under a tent in the in the bus parking lot at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, located at the intersection of Illinois and 32nd Street. Again, this is a free event. Um, Exposure to lead can affect body systems and is particularly harmful to young children and women of childbearing age. The Marion County Public Health Department and the Children's Museum of Indianapolis are partners in this event. Um, We'll repeat this information later in the program. So we are having a conversation this morning about the threat of lead to public health in our community, especially among children. This conversation is being presented in partnership with the Indianapolis chapter of the NAACP and the ongoing work it is doing with this outreach in the community. In our previous segment, we talked with Senator, uh, State Senator Jean Bro um, about legislation related to this. With us now in studio to get the state's perspective on this important issue is Lindsay Weaver, MD, um, Commissioner of the Indiana Department of Health. It's a pleasure speaking with you on Medically Speaking this morning. Hi, Dr. Scott. Thanks for having me. And so, uh, Dr. Weaver, you began working as a commissioner very recently um, after being appointed by Governor Holcomb. Um, Could you tell us about your past work uh, with the Indiana Department of Health and how it led to your current role as commissioner? Yeah, sure. So I started um, as state health commissioner on June 1st Mm -hmm. um, of this year. So I've just been doing it for about four months. But before that, I was the chief medical officer for the past three years at the Department of Health. So I do have, um, you know, pretty much uh, some substantial experience, I would say, (laughs) in the last uh, many years in public health. And really, I'll say this has been the honor of a lifetime to serve um, in this space for the state of Indiana. Um, I'm an emergency medicine physician by training. I still work here downtown at Methodist um, in the ED once a week. Um, It's important for me to keep on seeing patients. um, And I'm able to apply public health to see my patients and also as I see my patients um, to public health. And I mean, people who come to the emergency department, I think are especially, you know, here and where I work really show um, the opportunities and how we can improve health outcomes for people. No, I love that. Um, When it comes to public health, I think it's so important to actually be immersed in the field as well. So that's wonderful. Um, What role does the 
I'm not even sure what the IDOH is. Yeah, but Indiana okay. Department of Health. There we go. Yeah. And what role does it play in the implementation of House Bill 1313? So we're, we're excited um, about this bill, recognizing that lead is an invisible threat, really, mm-hmm. um, to children across the state of Indiana. And of course, you know, bigger than that, but we're in charge of Indiana here. Um, a, a huge role that we're playing is making sure that clinicians across the state know um, about the requirements and and, and also, of course, the why behind it. And, right. of course, also making sure that um, that Hoosiers know, that families, that moms, uh, dads, loved ones know that it's important to get their kids tested. So we worked with the Indiana chapter of the American um, – uh, of pe- for pediatrics um, and also for um, the family practice um, um, physicians and to help communicate with them, let them know about the bill, make sure that they have the resources that they need um, in order to make sure that kiddos are getting tested as recommended. Mm-hmm. Um, now, how are you informing the public that children from infants to six years old should be tested and what organizations are you working with on this? So we um, have launched a campaign, the Lead Free Indiana campaign. And we have a website, um, leadfreeindiana.org. I recommend people check it out if you want to learn more. Um, But with that, we're doing TV ads. We have radio ads. Maybe you have heard them as you're driving around. Um, And, of course, social media things, Mm -hmm. right, in order to get the word out. Um, We're also working with the Hoosier Environmental Council, the NAACP, and minority health coalitions from across the state. Because we know it's more than just hearing a TV ad or a radio ad encouraging to get your, your child tested. It also, you know, people want to hear it from people within their community um, mm-hmm. and make sure that especially those kids who are most at risk are, are th- that their families are hearing about this. Right. Um, so are all health care providers required to test the children? And I'm also interested in what this testing looks like for the children. Yeah, so the law does require providers to offer the testing. Now, not all providers have the ability to actually do the testing, mm-hmm. but they do need to, you know, give the family that recommendation and tell them, you know, the child is at the age where they need to be tested. So everybody under the age of six, from six months to six, should be tested at least once. Mm-hmm. But the recommendation is actually to get tested at your first year um, pediatrician appointment or doctor's appointment mm-hmm. and also on year two. So year one and year two, because even mm-hmm. if you're okay in year one, um, you may, could be exposed before year two. Too. Right. And then for kiddos who potentially, you know, um, like I, I have a little girl that just turned six. So, mm-hmm. you know, when, when she went in for her fifth birthday um, appointment, it would have been good for the doctor at that point to check and say, OK, has she been tested for lead at all? And then right. she hasn't offered it then. Right. Yeah. OK. Um, and are there any type of requirements or enforcements in place related to the lead? Uh, testing. So the requirement for providers is to offer the testing. Right. Um, and we're working with providers to make sure that they're aware of that. And again, to make sure that they know um, where they can send people to get tested if they're not able to offer it. And then kind of what are the next steps if you identify an elevated mm-hmm. um, lead level? There are a couple exceptions, for example, ER doctors, some specialists, right, where it's not really, that's not the, the place to be talking about lead. We're taking right. care of an emergency in that situation. Um, but for the most part, all, pro- all providers that are taking care of kids should be offering lead testing. Okay. Um, so question from a dental standpoint, um, as I see my patients that are coming in with parents that are under six years old, is that something that I should be speaking to them about? Like seeing your primary care doctor, making sure that's been tested. Um, do you think that's important for other physicians to bring up to patients to see their primary care doctor about? So I would love if you would do that. Yeah. I mean, so <laughs> technically not required, but right. I think that, I mean, I always, and I even, you know, when I'm in the emergency department, I am talking to people about smoking and vaping and healthy behaviors and other things. I think it's all of our, everybody in the medical field, it's our job to make sure that we're, when we have someone in front of us that we're talking about these things. So yes, I would love to see uh, the dental community and you as well to get engaged and be talking to people about this. And I think the other part of this that I haven't said before is we're also educating families so that they can advocate to their providers to say, hey, I I want my kid tested for Mm -hmm. lead. They haven't been tested yet. I've heard about this. I heard the advertisement. I heard this radio segment. Um, So we do encourage families to talk to their clinicians about it. Absolutely. And this is, it's a newer uh, law requirement, correct? So 
just so our listeners aren't, you know, going off on our providers. This isn't something that should have been being offered or required to be offered for the past 30 years, right? You're yeah. exactly right. So this is just, you know, started this year and we mm-hmm. have seen an increase in testing. So we know it's working. Um, so if we compare like last January through June and this year's January through June after the law started, we've actually seen a thousand percent increase oh, wow. in kids being identified with elevated blood lead levels. So wow. so it's working. Um, so lead testing has been around for a really long time. Um, um, kids who had Medicaid were required to get tested before, Mm -hmm. um, but we know that we're not catching every kid. We don't know every home that has lead, and so that's why this legislation went in for three years. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, to go back to Senator Bro's um, question is, okay, so we're going to do this for three years. We're going to look at the data. Mm -hmm. We're going to say, hey, are we really identifying everybody? Do we know where we need to be concentrating the lead abatement in communities? Um, And then um, we'll reevaluate in three years. Do we need to keep doing this, or does it look a little bit different, or Mm -hmm. We, you know, what, what ages are we identifying it? And so then we'll, we'll see what we need to do next. So um, what do you feel as a doctor and public health professional is important for families to know about the threat of lead in the home, especially for children? Yeah. So again, it's it's an invisible poison, right? It's in the dust on the windowsill, um, around the baseboards. It's uh, on the painted porch, right? Um, it could be in the soil. It can be in the um, in the water, in the in the pipes as well. But mostly, lead paint is where we're seeing that poisoning. So um, little kiddos, um, you know, because they're growing, they they absorb lead at ten times the rate that adults do, right? And plus, we know kids are they're running around. They pick things up. They put them in their mouth. I mean, that's how they explore their world, right? As they're crawling around on the floor. So they're not, adults aren't getting exposed in the way that kiddos are. Um, and it just takes a very little bit. So an exam, uh, a comparison would be like a sugar packet in an Olympic size pool. Like that's mm. how microscopic amount of lead can cause poisoning and cause damage. And mm. there's nothing to cure it. Once the mm. kid has been exposed and, and has the lead in their system, there's not a shot, there's not a pill, there's not anything to do to cure that. So that's why it's so important that we identify it so we can stop that exposure for that kid mm. and then also get it out of the home so that their siblings aren't exposed or any other child that would come into that home at a later time might be exposed right. to it. Um, How will this legislation help address this issue in communities across Indiana, and what do you hope is the impact? Um, I, I mean, we're already seeing the impact that we're identifying more kids. Mm-hmm. And so we'll be able to narrow in and really find, you know, where where are those exposures at? And it may not even be, um, you know, in like my my own home. It mm-hmm. may be in my caregiver's home or maybe a family member's home or maybe even like at a daycare. I mean, we don't know, right, yeah. all these potential places where we could have led. And Senator Bro said, you know, this is something that we could eradicate. Um, and I agree. I think that as we continue to get more kids tested and as we identify, you know, more children as we've had with elevated blood levels, we'll be able to identify those locations and and get the lead out of that environment. Absolutely. Um, What are some other issues that you see as being uh, important to address with Hoosiers as public health seeks to improve health outcomes and create a better quality of life in residents of all ages? Yeah, so we're... um, currently launching um, what we're calling Health First Indiana, Mm -hmm. um, which came out of the legislation from this past session that made funding available to local health departments across the entire state. So every county had the opportunity to opt into that funding Mm -hmm. um, to address their, what their needs are locally, the core public health services, maternal and infant mortality, um, obesity, trauma and injury prevention, lead assessment, um, and lead testing as well. And, you know, there's quite a list of different things that we could be addressing. And so we had 86 of our 92 counties opt in to that funding, which we're very excited about. So we're working with the counties right now to help them identify, you know, what are the biggest risks in their community and what are potential, you know, programs and things that they could do to address those issues that is unique to their to their county, to their community. So Marion County um, is one of the counties that that opted in and we're having, you know, great conversations with all of our counties. They're excited. This is the biggest. investment that the state has ever put into public health. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is really exciting. And I think that we're, I personally think we're we're leading the nation in this. And we know that the nation's watching because they want to see, you know, what is Indiana, what is Indiana doing? What are they going to do with this funding? How are they going to address health outcomes with it? So what does the testing look like as far as testing the children and testing homes? 
Yeah, so the kids, um, it's a blood test, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's a blood test, again, recommended at one and two, mm-hmm. and if not uh, done then, that just be, you know before they're six years old to get them tested. Um, if they identify an elevated level on that initial blood test, there is some follow it, follow-up testing to make sure that it's, you know, the first test is just more kind of like a screen mm-hmm. test um, to identify like their blood blood level. And then if they do have an elevated level, there's case management. So the, you know, somebody will work with the family to, to start trying to identify where could the p- potential exposures be. And then there's testing of the home. And then there's a process of actually remo- removing it from the home. Right. Um, so what do you see as the importance of local health departments um and the impact that they can have on the health of their residents. Yeah, so to, to go back to Health First Indiana, uh, we recognized during the pandemic how important uh, local health departments were to providing care within their community. Mm-hmm. Um, and many of our, especially our rural counties, it's one of like the a very few touch points um, for for even clinical care, um, but care in general in their whole county. Right, everybody has to go to that local health department to get their you know their their childhood immunizations or right. um, you know in or many other things depending on what county. So we're working with our health departments right now so that they can also offer lead testing. Um, about 50 of our health departments are able to do it now, but we have many more that are coming on board just to be another place mm-hmm. that people can get their kiddos tested. Um, and then also that they have case management to do that next follow-up piece. So uh, they, they play a huge role um, across our state. So to recap, um, Dr. Weaver, what do you want Hoosiers to know about lead and the importance of testing children? Yeah, I think there, I think the the important thing to remember here is that um you know, you, you wouldn't know unless you got tested. Right. And this is like, it causes lifelong problems, decreased IQ, behavioral problems. Um, and again, there's no no way to cure it. So the only way to know is to do this screening um, and this testing. And, and you should feel empowered to talk to your provider and, you know, request the testing for your kiddo if they if they fall in that age range. Absolutely. Um, so Dr. Winsey, <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> Call me whatever. <laughs> Dr. Lindsay Weaver um, is commissioner of the Indiana Department of Health. We're very grateful for your time this morning and sharing your expertise on this issue. Thank you. Um, so up next, we'll talk to Carla Johnson with the Marion County Public Health Department about its lead program, including education, outreach, and testing children after this break on Medically Speaking. Each day, the Marion County Health Department works to make Indianapolis the nation's healthiest city through its educational programs, community-based services, and interaction with community partners. Marion County Health Department employees are committed to providing excellent public health services. Whether it's offering childhood immunizations, providing nutritional assistance through the WIC program, sponsoring asthma and smoking cessation classes, offering guidance and support through our social services program, the health department exists to improve the health of our community. The Marion County Health Department also inspects all of our food service providers, helps keep neighborhoods clean, ensures that our well water is safe, combats rodents and mosquitoes, and is on alert to respond to public health emergencies. Most Marion County Health Department services are free or offered at a minimal cost. For more information about the Marion County Health Department, call them at 221-2000. That number again is 221-2000. Or check them out at www.mchd.com. The famous Tom Joyner Beach Party is back on the Tom Joyner Foundation Fantastic Voyage 2024. Cabins are on sale now, so don't miss the boat on Royal Caribbean's Independence of the Seas. Port of Calls includes Labadee, Puerto Plata, and San Juan, Puerto Rico from April 27th through May 4th. If you want to party with a purpose, get your girls or guys and book your cabin today by calling 214-495-1963 or go to FantasticVoyage2024.com to book online before the cabins are all gone. Vaughn Wamsley was a student at Indiana University when a careless driver hit him, putting him in a coma. Doctors said he'd never recover, but Vaughn lived and realized he'd survived for a reason. To become an attorney and fight for car accident victims being pushed around by insurance companies. If you're hurt, let Vaughn fight for you. 800-850-5054 Vaughn Wamsley Expect more 800-850-5054 
I can't believe how expensive gas is. Oh, I never pay full price for gas. I use the free Upside app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Can you really get paid cash back when you buy gas with the Upside app? I've made around $200. That's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free Upside app now. Download the free Upside app to earn real cash back every time you buy gas. Cash out any time to your bank account, PayPal, or e-gift card. Download the free Upside app now and use promo code STAR for an extra 25 cents per gallon cash back on your first fill-up. That's promo code STAR. Welcome back to Medically Speaking, sponsored by the Marion County Public Health Department. I am your host, Dr. Brooke Scott. So I wanted to share some information we mentioned earlier in the program. The Indianapolis chapter of the NAACP is joining Anthem, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield to sponsor a free community baby shower and lead testing event tomorrow. Um, Again, this is tomorrow, October 1st, from 2 to 4 p.m. This will take place under a tent in the bus parking lot at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis, which is located at the intersection of Illinois and 32nd Street. Again, this is a free event. Um, Exposure to lead can affect body systems and is particularly harmful to young children and women of childbearing age. The Marion County Public Health Department and the Children's Museum of Indianapolis are partners in this event. Um, So please join us tomorrow, October 1st from 2 to 4 p.m. in the parking lot of the Children's Museum. Um, Today's Medically Speaking program is focused on lead testing, especially in young children. This program is being offered today in partnership with the Indianapolis chapter of the NAACP, who plays an important role in education and outreach of this topic with the Indiana Department of Health, the Marion County Public Department of Health, and other partners. (laughs) Um, Next, we're going to welcome Carla Johnson to the program. Uh, Carla is the administrator of the Marion County Public Health Department, um, administrator of health. Healthy Homes. It's a very long name. Yes. Okay. I'm like, did I say that wrong? Um, I think there's more. Environmental Consumer Management and Senior Care Department. Correct. Okay. Um, So, welcome to Medically Speaking, Carla. Thank you. Um, What role does the Marion County Public Health Department play in the testing of the lead for our children? Uh, Well, we, um, in my department, which um, actually has, like I said, a long name, but so we have other things that we do in our department, but lead is being the primary one. Uh, we provide case management services. We do the testing, the blood lead testing, uh, education, outreach, just if everything surrounding uh, lead poisoning, lead exposure, mm-hmm. and um, the support to those families. And are some symptoms irreversible once a child um has lead poisoning and has gone without treatment? So there are things that, that are... Uh, considered irreversible, and especially if the children do not get treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, But that doesn't mean that they cannot be addressed. And so one of the things that I do when I'm talking to families or that I want the people in our department to express to people when they're talking to families is that they're we need to empower them to be able to do what's best for their children. So Mm -hmm. if we start talking about things that are irreversible, then somebody may feel um, a a lack of urgency to address those needs. So everything, I think, can be mitigated, even if it can't be completely reversed or undone. So we need to make sure that we, we don't just stick our head in the sand and say, well, there's nothing I can do, so therefore there's nothing I will do. Absolutely. Um, Can lead poisoning affect a child's behavior and performance in school? It can. And so I'll give an example. And I think that many people who've known me over the years um, know that my one of my children was lead poisoned. And I didn't really identify that um, until uh, actually it was my work in this program, this oh, department wow. that helped me identify that for my child. And so there were some struggles uh, throughout this his school time in school. So but I think that, um, again, it could be, and it probably was related to his his, his exposure, but mm-hmm. that doesn't give me or him any reason why we can't work on the things that are challenges. And Absolutely. so there can be some challenges in school, and there'll be a lot of challenges, and so you just have to identify them and address them. Okay, gotcha. Um, are there any, I'm not sure this might be a question that I'm asking later, but are there any, uh, I guess, specific symptoms that parents could look for in their children? There will be nothing that they will be able to say. I think they will be able to say, yes, this is lead poisoning because it can look like a lot of things. And so when my son was younger, I can tell you hindsight's Mm 20-20. And I can tell you that I saw in him. uh, uh, First of all, let me put this. He was a year. So you have to look at. 
the behaviors of a one-year-old, and, you know, they can look like any number of things. He was very active. He was very hyper. He was a lot of things. But would I say that that's unusual for any one-year-old? Maybe hindsight, 2020, yes, but at the time, it did not look much different. Right. Um, if, the, if your levels get high enough, then, yes, you'll start to see things. But that's very, you know, for the most part, for the average person, you're not necessarily going to see something that says this is definitely lead poisoning. Right, right. So um, that's why it's important. I'm sorry. That's why it's important to get them tested. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, does the health department provide uh, case management and what other services are available? Absolutely. We require or we um, provide case management. So how it looks generally is that we'll get the information from the state in terms of the lead poison or children, uh, uh, you know, blood levels, and then mm -hmm. the elevated children are assigned to a case manager. Okay. Once those children are assigned to a case manager, that case manager follows those children um, until they have either tested out of the program. They've got uh, consecutive lead uh, lead tests that are below at this point 3.5. Um, or they're seven years old. Mm -hmm. So we will follow those children for that amount of time. What they do um, is they get a, an inspection, an environmental inspection, so a, lead, a risk assessment lead inspection of their home and any other homes that they may frequently visit. So like Dr. Weaver said, it may not be the home that you're in. It can be your grandparents' home, a friend's home, anything. But if they spend a significant amount of time there, um, then they will we will also try to inspect those homes. Now, HUD has a definition of what, you know, uh, the number of hours you can spend at a home that would, you know, make it a um, something you would want to look at. And that's 60 hours a year. That's not much time at right. all, 60 hours a year. Yeah. So we will do a test of that home. The case manager will make sure that the child gets tested according to CDC guidelines, retested according to CDC guidelines, and we work with the uh, property owners to get their homes cleaned up. Um, if it's a rental, we, um, you know, it doesn't matter, actually, if it's a homeowner or a rental, but we do need to work with them to get those cleaned up. It's not always easy, and sometimes we try to find resources. There may be some uh, some federal funding, but it's not always easy. But we try to help them get that done. Now, is there significance in the age, uh, six or seven? You know, is there a reason why once they get to that age, we're no longer doing the testing? Well, at that point, they're con they, they, they're considered adults for lead poisoning purposes. Oh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, we don't test them after that. And it has to do with the development of the brain, the oh, blood-brain okay. barrier, and those sort of things. And so after that age, they, they are, you know, not the children that we live. Now, we will not, or work with, we will not... Um, if there is a, a parent or a child that really wants our services, we're not going to turn them down. Absolutely. But at that age, we we don't follow them for this. Gotcha. Um, so what are the educational messages that you want to share with the audience about the threat of lead and the importance of testing children? Well, again, it's, it's um, not something that's going to be readily and easily identifiable, especially when you have young children that you know are at home, maybe running around. You may think that they're always this way, that this is something that's normal for their age or their environment or whatever, and it might not be. If you live in an older home or if your child li or visits an older home, you think that child might be at risk. Well, actually, it's, it's required by law at this point, but even if, you know, that your your physician offers it to you, don't turn it down. Mm -hmm. It is something that is important to know because early intervention is going to be what your child needs to to help with anything, any of the long-term consequences of yeah. that. It has to be early intervention. And one of the things that we do with our case management is that we do refer children to first steps, um, and other early intervention programs just to make sure that they are able to get that intervention early mm -hmm. and work on it, you know, longer and through school. What happens is sometimes these children with these, these um, issues may end up, or when they go to school, and now there's a lot of structure. So you go from having little structure because you're running around at home and mm -hmm. you're not in school to having to have this structure. And it's, a, it's, it's already a culture shock, even if you don't have other environmental issues going right. on. But th th so that's tough. So it's really important to identify those. You can prepare the child. You can get them the services that they need. If they need any kind of uh, IEPs or anything like that for the schools, those can be addressed early and so that they can be successful. One of the things that has always been a passion of mine, probably because I have lived this, is that we 
spend a lot of time wanting to identify children mm -hmm. and preventing them. And the primary pre prevention measures are important. The secondary prevention measures are important. But once these children are identified, we can't forget that they now have a lifelong mm -hmm. uh, condition that they need to have addressed. So we cannot just say that once a child enters school, we're done with you and we say goodbye and we send you off to first grade. We've got to manage, we've got to help them get through high school Absolutely. and whatever they want to do after after high school we've got to help them do that mm -hmm. and so in sixth grade that sixth grade child that was poisoned at one still has those effects we cannot forget them in sixth grade and ninth grade and twelfth grade and beyond absolutely and so is that part of you all's program is to try to kind of can or follow them throughout or is that maybe like some new thoughts that we're, we're going to try to implement no that is my soapbox <laughs> okay okay <laughs> that is my soapbox and i carry it where i, and I stand <laughs> on it and i preach from it as often as i can uh -huh. but we focus on children at the at gotcha. the health department in six and under and pregnant women mm -hmm. and um you know but as a coordinated mes message that you know, is as strong as I would like for it to be. That's not where we're at yet, but Absolutely. I carry that torch. So with the pregnant women, are you testing the women? Or are you testing the baby as soon as they're born? The women. Okay. The women, gotcha. yeah. And so if, sorry, this is kind of my own questions, mm -hmm. but if you, if you test the mom and there is an elevated level, I guess, how would you guys move forward with that? Just monitoring the baby? Or? Well, no. So if we test the mother, then we will go into the home and help the mother understand mm -hmm. where she's getting exposure yeah. and, and usually adult exposure is a little bit different than children's exposure yeah. there you know there's a, a different reason why that's happening maybe it's a hobby maybe they're fixing up their home mm -hmm. and they're not doing it correctly it's not because they're crawling around on the floor or eating dirt right and so um and one of the things i think is real important when i talk about you know um the children and they get exposed we have the epa level for a a yard a child's play area in a yard there's a there's a standard and it's 400 parts per million mm -hmm. and um and and anything above that's considered elevated for say a child's play area i had and i live in an older home so i had my home my yard tested when even when my son was younger and it was at 200 parts per million now that's not considered elevated mm -hmm. and yet my son was a dirt eater and mm -hmm. he still got poison so it is important to know that these standards are there but that that anything under say 400 is not necessarily not dangerous right you need to be aware of what's going on um, so do you feel that the message is being heard or do you feel that people don't understand the threat that lead can have in children so I think the message gets heard, uh, and I think uh, you know in my work, just on the on the local level and, and with people I worked with, sometimes people have a lot of other issues going on too, mm -hmm. and so you can hear this message. But my child looks fine; mm -hmm. he's you know he's a little active, but boys are active or whatever. Mm -hmm. Your child's active, but I'm worried about where I'm going to live, or if I report this to my landlord am i going to lose my place where i live right and so people are put in some really difficult situations and so i think I, i'm not going to say they're not hearing the message i'm saying they have to balance that message with everything all the other threats in their lives yeah. and so we have to make sure that we help them as best we can so what are some good resources for people to learn more about this topic well, there's always the websites. There's the state's website, um, and I don't have that right offhand, mm -hmm. but um, there's ours. We have one called Mission Unleaded. And I will say this. I want to I want to put this plug in for a project that we're working on that I think is really going to be helpful. It's in the very beginning stages, and so people should not be um, – looking forward in the next few months but we are trying to get a website together it's going to be a link and we right now the t the temporary word for our name of it is lead registry and it's going to hopefully empower uh, individuals to be able to make educated decisions about where they want to live so the idea is that you will put in your address and it's going to use AI and it's going to gather as much information about that property as they, as you can, as it can, um, to give you all the lead history of that property. So you'll be able to see whether or not there was, um, um, you know, a lead exposure at some point. Uh, it is required by law that a landlord does provide you or your seller, your, you know, to provide you with any lead information on the home mm -hmm. that may or may not be happening. 
but this empowers them to find that information themselves. They're, you know, the hope is to have a chat bot if they want to be able to discuss a little bit about what's going on in this uh, site, but it is going to be able to gather, you know, scrape the internet as the term I've heard used by our <laughs> vendor, scrape the internet and compile that information and some easily digestible information for the person to be able to say, I want to live at 123 Elm Street and put that information in and get all of the history and information about that home and they can make an, an informed incision and empower them to decide this is good for my family. This is not good for my family. Awesome. You said that's something that's being worked on right now. Mm -hmm. oh, that's wonderful. Love that. Um, so can someone contact your department with questions to learn more? Absolutely. 317-221-2155, uh, I believe is the number. <laughs> How about they call me? 317-221-22, what is my number? 221 I don't know my number. They can call the health department. Because <laughs> the health department, all the numbers are 317-221. Yes. I don't know what the rest is, but the two. It's 2211. That's it. I had to think about it. 317-221-2211. <laughs> all right. Um, and what do you feel are the most important messages for our listeners to take away from this conversation this morning? And that is actually a question directed to both um, you, Ms. Johnson, and as well as you, Dr. Weaver. Uh, the most important message? I, yes. Well, I do think that they need to, um, I, I would love for people to understand the importance of identifying children early and getting those resources. There is a wealth of resources here in Indianapolis and Marion County and the state. And so to be able to reach out and get those resources, uh, just to make sure that they are doing what they need to do for their family. So they it is. It really isn't enough just to test your children mm -hmm. and get that information because you test them. Now you have to find out where that exposure came mm -hmm. from. So you really, it's a, it's two things you have to do: test your child and test the child's environment. Right. So that's my message. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so our website's ledfreeindiana.org. Okay, thank is you. State, is the state website? Yeah. Um, I think I, I would say same. Um, it's really the early intervention is what's key here. So identifying it early, and and one, it does matter to that individual child because you can stop further exposure, right? right. Um, which I think is important to remember. So there is something that you can do, but also it is the other you know children in the home that are either live there, or coming in now, or some um, sometime down the future. Um, um, and uh, yeah, just, you know, get educated. Um, don't be bashful about talking to your providers about it. Um, you know, even maybe you don't have kids, but you have lots of nieces or nephews, you know, talk to your family and say, hey, I heard about this and um, just wanted to make sure that we're doing everything we can to to protect our kids. And, yeah. and we can. There is something that we can do about this. Yeah. Um, did either of you have anything else you would like to share with our listeners before we close our segment? I think I'm fine. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity yeah. um, to talk about this subject. I do think it's not something that everybody is aware of and knows about, um, but it is, is really important, and, and we're excited about all these uh, these opportunities. All right, and it looks like we have a caller on the air, uh, potentially with a question. Does bad poison mimic ADD, ADHD, and appear as autism in a child? Um. You know, it's hard to say if it mimics it. I'm not really sure if that, I mean, you know, I when I, I look at my own personal experience, um, and my son was later diagnosed with uh, ADHD, um, I think that maybe there's, a, a, you know, something that to be said for that. I, I cannot speak for the autism. I, I don't have that information, and I don't feel qualified to answer that information or that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, we know that lead poisoning does alter the brain. Um, and like I said, it can decrease I IQ, um, have learning disabilities, um, and also um, behavioral problems um, through through childhood and life. And so, you know, many of those are going to be similar to, or some of that's going to be similar to some of the symptoms um, of other diagnoses. It's hard to kind of go back and pinpoint exactly, you know, what is the cause of the different, you know, either the learning disability um, or the behavioral problems. But um, um, yeah, I'm sure there's definitely some some cross there. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, Carla Johnson is the administrator of the Healthy Homes Environmental Consumer Management and Senior Care Department. Got at the it. Main you got it. Public you got it. That's Department. right. <laughs> um, Carla, we appreciate you this morning. <laughs> thank Dr. You. Weaver, we appreciate you as well. Um, I would like to thank all of our guests for joining us this morning on Medically Speaking. Uh, State Senator Jean Bro, um, Indiana Department of Health Commissioner Dr. Lindsay Weaver, and Carla Johnson of the Marion County Public Health Department. And special 
thanks to the Indianapolis chapter of the NAACP for its assistance in arranging this outstanding lineup of guests and bringing light to this issue. This has been Medically Speaking, sponsored by the Marion County Public Health Department. I'm your host, Dr. Brooke Scott. Be sure to follow the health department on its official social media accounts for important news and information. We also invite you to visit the website at marionhealth.org. Thank you again for joining us this morning. You've been listening to Medically Speaking on Praise AM 1310, 95.1 FM. Thank you for tuning in. The views and opinions expressed on Medically Speaking are not necessarily those of Praise AM 1310, 95.1 FM, Radio 1, or its management. Tune in next Saturday morning for Medically Speaking on Praise AM 1310, 95.1 FM. Seating was a paid program. WTOC AM, W236CR.